thank you again to our digital ag panelists. Um, they did a wonderful job, very insightful, and so impactful to think about the adoption of technology at the farmer level. As I mentioned, we're now transitioning into a fireside chat. Our Associate Chancellor for Strategic Partnerships and Initiatives here at the University of Illinois is now gonna lead us in a chat with CM with Corteva AgriSciences. Thank you, Ken. No. Oh, there we go. He's like, boy, she has a PhD, but she's not very smart. That's the look that guy you just gave me. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kim Kidwell, and it is my delight and pleasure to uh, uh, have this, this time with Sam. Sam and I are both alums of University of Illinois and uh, very proud graduates of ACES, and all of our friends might be surprised that we've reached this level of uh, success in our careers based on our undergrad experience this year, but here we sit. So. Uh, we came at this from two very different perspectives. I've been in academia my whole career, and Sam's been in industry his whole career. And we're going to talk a little bit about what success looks like in ag tech and how we might be able to join forces from the academic industry perspectives uh, to push forward ag tech to the next heights of success. So, Sam, as you know, as, as you know, a loyal graduate of University of Illinois. What we really love to do is graduate people like you that go into the world and do good things. We like to feed the talent pool uh, for the cutting edge advancement of research. And we do a lot of research here that we hope helps push that forefront forward as well. And success for us really kind of looks like grant acquisition, research papers, students that we develop for the pipeline. And in Ag Tech, there's a lot of people that do research in that arena here. From the company's perspective, how does your definition of, of success in ag tech uh, roll out for you guys, especially compared to what we do in a university? Yeah. Well, great. Uh, first of all, thanks, Kim, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to be back on campus, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here at ag tech. It's been a couple of years, so it's, it's expanded, so congratulations. It's really, really neat to see. Um, and Kim, it's a pleasure to be up here talking with you as a fellow plant breeder. Um, you know, so if you think about what we're trying to do in, in, as a company out there serving farmers and society ultimately is, you know, how do you get the innovation to the farm? And, and so success for us, we think about, when we think about working with uh, ag technology, whether it's universities, startups, or even other companies and entities, uh, we're always looking at, well, how does that innovation solve a problem? We heard that a lot on the last panels, like you got to solve real problems. Um, is it going to create uh, real value, either simplicity or economic value to the customer you're trying to uh, service? Uh, can it ultimately help solve problems of, you know, you know agriculture, we're, we're producing a lot of food, right? And we have to produce a lot of food. And the reality is it has an impact on the environment. So you can also look at this equation and say success could be, is, can we do it in a way that reduces some of the environmental impact uh, of food production uh, at the end of the day? And then, then I'd probably say the last area we look at for when we think about collaborations with, with universities and startups and ag tech in general is, is the talent and, and really the skill sets of the people and the individuals because you know, I'm, I'm getting close to the end of retiring my career and you got to keep thinking about, well, who's the next generation, the next generation because you know, we, we, I think we had the question of 50 years of agriculture, we will need innovation in the next 50 years of agriculture. So you got to have the right next group of talent and individuals that can lead forward and, and solve this. So get it out there to a farmer and solve a real problem and really think about the, the next generation of people. Great thoughts. You know, this is a question you and I haven't discussed much, but it, it kind of comes to mind. When you think about it, I think a lot of people think market share is all that drives industry. You know, how much money can you make on this technology? And so much of this technology is really expensive to, to develop. When, when do you make the decision to either lean all the way in or pull out as far as that, that goes? Because I, I, I think that's a delicate dance that, you know, for us, if we can fund it, we can do it. But for you guys, there, there's got to be that trigger that says, oh, we're, we're in too deep, we got to back out of this, or we're in too deep, we can't back out of this. Yeah, so um, we are a uh, publicly owned company, so we have shareholders that help guide us in that decision-making process along with our, our board of directors. Um, and look, we make no 
no uh, uh, denial that we have to have a return on our investment as a company also on that research. Um, I would say the, the way we've approached it is you know, we always start with what's the strategy of the company and, and for Corteva we're, we'll be five years here in uh, June as a, as a spin out uh, so we're kind of relatively new even though we have a long heritage and history with our, our companies uh, figuring out our strategy and our direction so one of the things we did actually in 2022 was a big strategy refresh and really honed in on what are the areas where we want to play as a company, how do we want to play in those spaces, and then what we thought we needed to do to actually be successful. What were going to be the investments, whether it's internal or external M&A, to really let us get there. And so, um, just like you do in your own personal house, what are the financials? We, uh, we rank things, and then uh, there's always a little bit of uh, you know, overlay what do you believe the future is? Because sometimes, you know, we do all the calculations financially and then you got to step back and look at some of it and say, yeah, but the trend line, the direction, what's going to happen in agriculture, this project, these line items really are bigger transformative than maybe something else. So it, there's a little bit of, as plant breeders, we used to say the science and art, there's the finance and the art associated with how we make decisions on investments. And that. So, I, you know, I've been in a situation where I've gone down and visited some companies and I've had to, you know, sign NDAs and I learn amazing things and I can't tell anybody, which is both heartbreaking and ter terrifying, you know, that you'll make a mistake. You know, when you look at advertisements for universities and companies, we all like to use this, we're at the cutting edge or we're at the leading edge. I, I'm curious, who, who is at the leading edge? You know, are we, are you, and, and does it matter as far as, you know, training the next generation of talent and our research por portfolio are concerned? Yeah, I, I don't think I'd say it's an either or. Um, clearly the research that gets done at the universities, I mean, it's, it's incredibly broad. Uh, there's research going on that we'll never touch in, in the private sector. Um, there's research going on in startups that we probably would never fund. And all those are really, really important. You think about the future, uh, the innovation we need in agriculture. And a lot of it, I'd say, we maybe don't even know what we, what we need, uh, what's going to be needed 20 years from now, 30 years from now. So that stuff's incredibly important. Um, the talent that you're training and creating, like, as I mentioned, like, who's the next generation, right, that, that's coming out of the university, so it's very, very critical. I think where we're good in the private sector is how do you take a lot of that technology, how do you twist it and turn it a little bit to really optimize it and get it into a product at scale, and then how do you go deliver that to customers around the world, right? So, it, you know, I think it was Norman Borlaug that always said to us as plant breeders, right, if it's, if it's not out in the farmer's field, it doesn't matter. And, and I, we, we keep that front and center as we think about our research and innovation program internally is, you know, while, while publications, patents, innovation are important, for us, we got to get it out to the farmer. It just doesn't matter. And um, so I think, I think the ecosystem for all of us is really important of, of how we do that. There's probably things we can do better, but, um, you know, there's front-end research we're never going to do, and there's probably scale, um, and, and sort of final, final mile in innovation that the universities couldn't do that we do. When, when you hire a, a new PhD or a new employee into Corteva, that, that first year probably is an interesting experience. I think a lot of people leave here thinking they got this roped and they're going to be value added day one to a corporation, Can, especially there's some students in the room. Yeah. Well, what does that really look like, that, that transition into, into industry for people that are newly minted PhDs or master's holders? Yeah, I, I had somebody explain it to me once, and this probably isn't totally correct now, but um, you, you go through life of you're at top and then you go back to the bottom, right? And so you, you come to the university, you're kind of at the bottom again, you work through graduate school, you're, maybe your advanced degree, you're kind of at the top, and you, you go out to the, to the, if you go to the private sector, even I'd say even if you're going to do an academic uh, career, you, you got to start over a little bit, right? Um, 
Normally what I would see, uh, especially if you're in the, the plant sciences or even our crop protection science space, um, scale is usually a, a first shock for people. Um, the, the, the magnitude of stuff private sector turns through is, is quite large. Um, pace, which you do it at, uh, you know, I think back on my PhD and yeah, you know, I took two years kind of analyze all my data and write up my papers and got pushed a little from faculty to do a little better. In the private sector, right, you don't. You, you know, you, I always tell plant breeders, you're gonna, you're gonna get your data starting in September and you gotta have it all analyzed, turned back in winter nurseries by Thanksgiving. And there is no redo, there's no do over, there's no second chance, there's no help coming. It's on you to go, go get it done. Um, so scale and pace, I think, is one. And, and then I think the thing that, um, you know, people sometimes lose sight of, but it is very true in all of it. We, we make choices all the time in the, in the private sector, right? We don't have unlimited funding. Uh, we have unlimited ideas and concepts from our people, but we have to make choices about what projects to do. And we do that every year. And it can be quite, um, you know, tough on a scientist. If you're, if you're new, you're coming in, you're on project A and B, and all of a sudden the company says, hey, we need to down emphasize project A, but we want you to shift to work on something else. So that, that agility, skill, especially in certain areas, is really important. Very good, very good. You mentioned a, a little bit of the, the aspect of some of the technology that comes out of universities, and I would say over the duration of my career, we've gotten much better at uh, allowing faculty to roll out startups, to support IP development, different things like that. I think it was almost unheard of there for a while when that was going on, and there's still room for us to improve for sure, but we've definitely gotten better at it. How has the entrepreneurial culture in the university, what we do here, the, the uh, rollout of some you know, really high-powered science, how, how has that impacted the company? Yeah, I, I, look, I think the universities have gotten a lot better. I think if I go back 20-some years ago, um, it was sometimes quite difficult for a private public sector to work together because we would fight over IP and publication rights and timelines and all sorts of stuff. And uh, today, I think both sides of the equation have learned to figure out how to navigate that a little better where companies at least realize what the universities have to have for success. And I think the university and faculty realizing, you know, as you work with a private sector, there are certain things that we just want to make sure are in place as we think about creating uh, products that ultimately create value long term for, for everybody. Uh, so um, I think we've gotten better at it. There's probably always more we can do. But uh, I'll go back to we're constantly looking at what's going on at the universities, what's going on at startups, trying to figure out where the next little interesting bit of innovation really is. And, and, and the task I give our organization is you ought to be the first one in the room when something interesting is happening, right? Because that's what we need to do as a, as a private sector is, you know, be the first one at the table to understand, wow, this is pretty cool new science. Uh, if it continues to develop or if we continue to add it with this, this, and this, we could go solve a problem over here or over there. It's connecting all the dots we have to be really good at. Do, do you actually have people that their full-time job is to figure out what's happening in the innovation side? That's what they do for a living? We do, and um, we have a centralized team that focuses on that, and then within every one of our major research functions, there are individuals designated to do that. And then across our, our group of scientists, uh, we basically have a, a program, I'd say might sort of mimic a little bit what a, uh, an academic career would be. You can, you can be at different levels uh, think about, you know, fellows and different levels of, of, of that status. Um, and that group of individual scientists uh, then come together and work on specific projects or targets. They're like ag tech scouts. Yeah, they really um, are. That, if that was a job when I was a student, I might have majored in ag tech scout. That would have been fun. 
Um, so for faculty, it's become actually important for us to have um, pathways to entrepreneurialism and startups, and we have our research park, which is nothing short of, of spectacular, one of the best in the country. Um, you know, so when we recruit faculty, they really want to be part of that ecosystem. And so thinking about, you know, the, what, what we develop in the lab, how that discovery translates to commercialization, I'm curious about, like, when, when do you guys make the decision to do it in-house versus mm -hmm. seek opportunities outside of the company to bring in to support you with advancing your technology? It, it, it varies a little bit. Um, of course, we, there are certain areas where I'd say we're probably not going to go outside the company. So I'll, I'll just, you know, I think about germplasm and plant breeding and development. Um, I won't say never, but it's unlikely we're probably going to come to a, a university and work on corn breeding together for products, right? Uh, so there are certain areas where we'd say, look, these are probably core, who we are, uh, what we're going to invest and own in internally. And then you look at all the other areas where new innovations occurring, take the seed business, you know, look at what's going on in gene editing, for example, tremendous amount of innovation happening around the world. And so we're constantly going out and looking like who should we partner with or collaborate with, maybe they're startups, faculty, whatever it may be, uh, to say, look, what you're doing there is innovative science. We, we think we can collaborate and work together to help turn that into more products at the end of the day, but we're probably not the company to go create that piece of science, right? That, that's really your area, your expertise uh, to do that. So we look a lot at it from a, a t really core capabilities, new advancements, where that technology is going. And then we'll get to a point and, and say, look, if it's big enough and valuable enough, at some point you bring it inside. Right? I mean, that's just kind of the way things go. And then you have to determine, are you going to go build it or are you going to go buy it? And we, we go through an analysis to say, when would we go invest in something and buy it? Or when would we start building it internally to create what we want? So you talked a little bit about this. You know, it, it can be complicated to work with universities in this IP, IP space. And, you know, there, there's, there's differences. You know, we, we look at research grants. We look at publications. You have to look at market share probably a little bit more carefully than we do. We, we probably aren't as nimble as uh, a company is. Um, over the course of, of your career, especially as you know, a leader in a company, how have you, we gotten better at this? And what are some of the obstacles that are still in the way of having really effective public-private partnerships? Because I think it's becoming more relevant every day. I, in some ways, I think the obstacles are similar, right? You know, what are we getting better at? And what do we still need to do to, to make this work more seamlessly? You know, I, I think we've gotten a lot more clarity on how to handle IP in general. I mean, it's never perfect, but I think from the private sector, we've got more comfortable with, say, a joint IP model and how to share in that value back to the university or faculty members. Uh, and I think the, in general, I'd say, where we've been successful, our, our faculty members understand that um, sometimes publication timelines need to be stalled while you get intellectual property in place. It's not, you can't publish, but there are usually some timelines just from a, a process that you have to kind of go through. And sometimes the first reactions of those conversations are not good. Uh, but, but usually, I, I think we're all kind of getting better to understand, you know, that, that that really helps sort of secure future value creation, which means more funding at the end of the day is, is what it's all about. Um, I, I think where we um, maybe sometimes still get hung up a little bit is, you know, you know sometimes as a private sector, we like exclusivity, right? And, and because we are in a competitive marketplace, uh, and obviously some, as a faculty, a lot of times you don't want exclusivity, right? You want it broad. And, and so working through that sort of relationship and figuring out what works is probably still where we sometimes get hung up the most when I think about some of the deals we try to do. You know, it's really hard to do something amazing, license the technology and never being able to talk about it again. 
that's actually happened to me. It was, it's just we aren't exactly wired that way in academia in some ways, and so that becomes a little bit tricky, and I think there's still work to do yep. there, perhaps. Um, my last question before we're gonna transition to uh, some questions from the audience. So we're a land-grant university. You're a big company. I I'm curious about what you need from us to help advance ag tech into the future. Well, again, I, so events like this are awesome because they get to bring the groups together. But I kind of go back to the basics. Uh, I, I'm, I'm from Illinois, so I'm pretty simple math, too. Um, the, uh, you know, we, we, need, we need skills and talented people, right? At the end of the day, that's, that's the organization. There's not some magic organization. It's, it's a collective of people that get it done. Uh, and, and we look to the universities to still be that source of how to train and create, you know, the next sort of raw material for the next group of talent uh, to go lead this industry. Uh, and then the, the, the research that uh, needs to be done in spaces that, you know, again, we probably can't afford because of our return on investment timeline, you know, just something we're not going to invest in and do, but, you know, I think is a better fit for a lot of times uh, uh, a university can, can do that. And then kicking out the startups, right? And, and I think the University of Illinois has gotten really good at that. It's one of the better ones at being able to let startups be kicked out because then we have a little more freedom to go work with those entities, right? Whether we want to put equity at play, whether we want to do JVs, whether we want to collaborate, whether we want to acquire. It becomes an asset that we can look at differently than, you know, I'm probably not going to be allowed to go acquire one of your faculty departments. So it's it's <laughs> it's a little we're, different. We're way. always open to conversations. <laughs> so so I think that that is really important. You think about the talent, the innovation, and then have a mechanism that the private sector can can lean into is really important for the universities. Thank you so much. Questions from uh, the audience. I baited his, his colleagues, yeah. uh, young they're colleagues, to ask him really hard questions, and they're like, not a chance. I'll take you up on that, Kim. All right. So sometimes when we're talking about what, a, what we want from, say, a new student, a new hire, you know, I hear a lot of times that we talk about, hey, we really want them to be effective communicators and also know the domain and so forth like that. Obviously, students are going to have a different balance of skills and different sorts of trade-offs of what they learn and what they get good at. In your perspective, Sam, which are the which is sort of the more important things for them to be getting from the university? The sort of here's your deep focus in your particular expertise and that sort of thing, and once we hire the students. We're going to make sure that they get that development and communication and that sort of thing. Or are we thinking maybe we want more rounded, well-rounded students and we'll help them get that depth after we hire them? I think I'd answer it as a, as a good lawyer that says depends, right? Um, and, and the reason I say that is there are, there are areas where we, we clearly want that deep technical ability. We want front edge, sort of the leading thinking about the science and how, where it's going. And if you're a bad communicator, I'll figure out how to deal with you, right? Um, that's usually what we do. Um, but holistically, you think about the company, and I would say one of the things that general scientists, we, we, we usually fail at, and I'll put myself in that category, uh, we're just not good communicators in general. And one of the things you have to do, whether you're in the academic world, you're in the startup world, you're in the private world, is the communication about why your research and projects matter ultimately determine your funding, right? And that's, that's true in our company uh, also. And so being able to tell the story of science, why it matters, and, and especially as we're getting into new spaces, you know, you look at, you know, the GMO for, you know, 25 years in biotech, and in a lot of ways we failed in how to communicate that to society and look where we ended up. Uh, and if you think about the seed world now, and we're headed down that path with gene editing, we have to tell a very different story to make sure that we have sort of the social freedom to operate to bring technology that can solve some real problems. So it, it is a balance. 
but there are times where we want the hardcore deep scientists and there are roles where we need you know the scientist that's very rounded and can communicate and talk about stuff. One more question before we wind down. Jack? Okay. Uh, sure. So uh, my name is Jack Mark. I actually work with a number of startups here through a, through a program that we operate, um, the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator. And there were two comments that you made that I was wondering if you could elaborate on a little bit, kind of, kind of stitch together. The first one having to do with what Corteva is focused on, what your strengths are, and how that affects how likely you are to work with an external partner. So obviously around genetics, uh, being Corteva's bread and, and butter, that's un, an unlikely vector for partnership directly on the genetics. But as far as research platforms and technologies and te techniques go, do you think Corteva would be more open to working with a platform that would help discover additional IP, which obviously Corteva owns, but the tools used to develop that might be a, a, a potential for external partnership. And then to connect that with a comment that you made later about a priority on competitive advantage. So if you knew that a competitor was using the same technology, would that impact how likely you are to use that, te yeah. that technology? Yeah, great question. Um, so back to the first part, uh, again, I would say if the platform, and since we'll talk seeds here a little bit more, um, you know, we, we tend to think about a platform like gene editing where we are going very broad and looking at a lot of collaborations, a lot of companies that are innovating and creating the capabilities and the system and you know some of the early concepts. Uh, our, our interest would be, well, how do we apply it to our plant breeding and germplasm program, which we would bring in-house and, and do it ourselves. Uh, so there are very much, uh, that's a space we'd be very open and we work with lots of groups to try to create innovation there and figure out the IP and ownership as we go along. Um, relative to our, our competitors, look, it's, it's, uh, it's an industry, it's a healthy industry to have competition. It's, it's really important that it creates a lot of choice for our farmers around the world, and it's something that we're uh, very committed to make sure that continues to be part of the agriculture sector. Uh, but, but given that, of course, you want to always try to be a little bit first one in the door. And so that's our objective is um, put the sign out that says we're, we're open for business, so bring us ideas and we'll talk. Maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't. Uh, but we're also going to be out there scouting and looking hard to say in these areas where we think it's absolutely the critical strategic direction for our company, we're going to be out looking hard for where can we go create uh, interactions and collaborations to, to drive that technology forward. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Sam. We're, you know, as, as uh, the former dean of the college and the present dean sitting over there, we're proud of you and we're grateful for our relationship with you. And uh, go Illini always. I, we, always. I, I, I think I saw in the ranking Purdue as a school might be ahead of us, so we better beat them tonight in basketball. <laughs> Yeah, I'm in. Thank you. Thank very you much. so much.